Alrighty, so I am actually very excited to bring you today's film because director John Carpenter is one of the greatest filmmakers of all time in my opinion. They Live in the Thing are two of my all time favorite movies. He also does the soundtrack to nearly all of his films. He has proven to master both the synthesizer and the genre of rock and roll. So today I'm going to talk about one of the worst films by one of the best directors. <laughs> Delightfully devilish, Seymour. <laughs> Yes, everybody, welcome back to Delightfully Devilish, the show where we discuss films that all at once meet the criteria of being the good, the bad, and the ugly. I'm your host, Jukebox Harry, and today we are looking at the last major film directed by John Carpenter. If you're thinking of The Ward, no, I don't really count that. That does not feel like a John Carpenter movie to me. Ghost of Mars is a 2001 science fiction action horror film and one absolute hell of a mess. Now, I know I say that about pretty much every film I review on this show, because, well, let's face it, that's the entire fucking point, but, uh... Lately, I have been able to review, film, and publish episodes of this show all in the span of one day. While trying to do Ghost of Mars, it actually took me three nights to get through the movie, and another morning just to corroborate my notes. Ghost of Mars was originally intended to be the third film in John Carpenter's Escape trilogy, following Escape from New York and Escape from LA. Unfortunately, after Escape from LA failed a box office, it was rewritten to be an entirely new film. And even though the film had a pretty original concept, the final product just did not live up to it. Now, I have an interesting relationship with Ghost of Mars, because the first time I watched it was back in 2016, when I was studying John Carpenter as part of me studying film back at the university. I didn't like Ghost of Mars, but I was interested in aspects of the story. So interested that later in the year when I started doing a short story writing unit, I actually tried retooling the story from Ghost of Mars into a fantasy story called The Sisterhood of Kotaku about a feud between two species. This is a film I would sincerely love to see done right one day, but that's not the case with this movie. Still, it does make for a fascinating viewing. The story begins on Mars in the year 2176. The planet has been colonized and nearly fully terraformed. And just look at the first name to pop up on the credits. Yeah, I wouldn't have expected him to be the star of a John Carpenter movie either. He did work with Alice Cooper once, but that guy was a rock star. This is the guy from NWA, which I fucking love, but like, still, these things go together like Cars 3 and Baked Beans. Oddly enough though, he isn't even really the star of this film. His screen time is very minimal. The intro is a very long series of shots of a very red train and a lot of fade transitions. The close-ups had me fooled, but with the last shot, it's really hard to pretend like we're not staring at a set of miniatures. We're greeted to a mostly female panel of judges because Mars is a matriarchal society. The film never does anything to explore this theme, but honestly, I'm okay with it. It means that the film doesn't spend too much time hearkening on about gender politics, but it also means that the role of women in power is a very normalized thing in the universe of Ghosts of Mars. In the book, Prince of Darkness, John Carpenter actually talks about utilizing this theme because he theorizes that in the future, Earth will become overrun and depleted of its natural resources due to the patriarchal way of our society functioning. He suggests that in the future, reproduction should be a thing that's controlled by women since they're the ones actually giving it to the world. And honestly, it's an interesting thought. Also, if you love John Carpenter or are a fan of any good read, I would highly recommend this book. It's fucking great. Then we cut to the train again. You're gonna see a lot of fades in this film. Drink every time you see one and you might actually enjoy it. Forces break onto the train to find Natasha Henstridge's character, Lieutenant Melanie Ballard. They were assigned to transfer a prisoner from the jail at Shining Canyon Mine back here to Crisey. What happened at Shining Canyon? We fade transition into a flashback. Whilst on a train, Ballard takes some sort of drug which causes the film to have a whole lot more fade transitions for some reason. Picking up James Williams. You mean Desolation Williams? Desolation Williams. What self-respecting police officer would actually call a criminal by that name? Cooling his heels in the Shining Canyon jail, deep solitary. What is the relevance of deep solitary? No matter how deep or how shallow you go, solitary confinement is still solitary. What's the charge this time? <sighs> Murder. Murder? Buku corpse is all mutilated. Shining Canyon, this is Transmarinara 74 Yankee. Hang on, Transmarinara? I, 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 uh, don't think those words go together. Here's your coffee, Mr. McSim. Three sugars and two whites just the way you like it. You want some? No, thanks. That's genuinely the most unlikable coffee guy that I've ever seen. You probably think this is some routine prisoner transfer. But that's what I want to bang into your heads. There's nothing routine about this prisoner. With a name like Desolation Williams, I don't think the word routine was ever going to be synonymous with this guy. Then another fade. And another one. I don't get why fade transitions are used so much in this film, they don't help it. They actually make it fundamentally a whole lot worse. They keep taking you out of the moment and make the film feel more like a slideshow than any kind of movie. I remember getting a similar feeling from watching John Carpenter's Vampires, and upon further research, I actually found out that the editor on this film and the editor on that film were in fact related. Vampires had Edward A. Walshilka, while Ghost of Mars had Paul C. Walshilka. I'm hoping that's how I pronounce the name, I really don't care. Edward was actually a frequent collaborator of John Carpenter, having done the editing on both Big Trouble in Little China and In the Mouth of Madness, but it seems like his brother Paul only ever saw his work on Vampires and was like, yes, John Carpenter's worst edited film, I'm gonna do that, but like, a whole lot worse. What do you say, guys? Are we fucking retarded, or are we retarded? Let's do it. Let's do it. It doesn't cost that much. In fact, it doesn't cost anything. Let's just fucking do it. Let's just fucking do it. Rookies, use your breathers. We're not gonna have air like Earth for 10 more years. Goggles on. 
<sighs> the characters exit the train at a remote mining town, only to find it dead silent. And this leads to another flashback. Friday night, the place should be packed. I mean, a whole 12 hours before sunup, and there's money to burn, whores to fuck, and drugs to take. Was that line written by a robot? Instead, we got a graveyard. Okay, that marks the one time in the film that the fade transition is used with any actual value. Ballard pairs off with Jericho Butler, a character whose entire arc is literally just to try to bang her. Sounds nasty. But you seem to be holding together all right. You know, what you see is nothing. I have numerous hidden talents. Jason Statham, you crafty son of a bitch. You're persistent, aren't you? I've changed a few minds in my time. That line must have bit Statham in the ass. Originally he was cast to play the lead role, Desolation Williams, but apparently the studio changed their minds because they wanted someone with more star power and then brought in Ice Cube instead. Are you a gambler? No, I'm short time sergeant. I believe in saving my money. So did audiences when this film first came out. It barely made back half its budget. This is not making me happy. All right. So far, me neither. We start to see the signs that a massacre has taken place, and then we cut back to the courtroom so that Ballard can tell us the story from the perspective of the others. This is a storytelling decision that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. First of all, we would only want to see their perspective on events because this is a courtroom setting and we want to see if their version of events would line up with your version of events. But secondly, you're telling the story from their perspective. You weren't there to see this. That doesn't make sense. What the hell's going on around here? We haven't had a meal or a piss break in six hours. Just guns open the door. All right, everybody, answer here when I call your name. Some filmmakers like to naturally cut from one shot to another. Pauly C is no one of them. Butch here decides to treat us to another flashback. It's literally a shot of a hot air balloon for a few seconds before we fade back to real time. Pauly C is bad enough in how he uses fades as transitions, but the way he integrates them with flashbacks to bring them to a whole new level of badness is just... That, that just shouldn't be a thing that exists. I remember talking about the film Inchon and saying that if the Golden Raspberry Award for worst film editing was a thing that this movie would win it, well, uh, Ghosts of Mars would be a definite shoe in This is one of the worst edited films I have ever seen in my life. We quickly fade back to be greeted by some very obvious green screen work of Butch on a hot air balloon. She crashes, and Paulie C won't even let the bloody thing explode without adding three fade transitions. The guy actively has to butcher everything that he physically can by using this technique. Paulie C has only gone on to edit one feature length film since Ghosts of Mars. That's one too many. Go check out Williams. Yep, that's how he made him. No lead up, no tension built. They literally just plonk this guy on the screen like that because the film doesn't know how to build atmosphere and uh, Paulie C doesn't know jack about editing. And to remind you of that, he doesn't even let our heroes approach the cell without adding two more fades. They ask if he knows anything. He stays silent. They walk away, but Paulie C forgets to fade this shot. Williams flips them the bird, but it's pretty arbitrary since there's nobody there to see it. This entire scene perfectly emphasizes so many things wrong with Ghosts of Mars. There's no story going on. The use of crossfades is just terrible. There's no use of camera work to convey what the characters are feeling. There's no music to add atmosphere. There's no tension on the reverse. Reveal, it just sucks. The very definition of suck. In the next scene, we have characters approaching a door with their guns ready, and look at this shot. You feeling anything yet? Like, anything at all? Didn't think so. Go get the commander. Well, wait a second, wait a second. Paulie C used a different transition? Oh, jeez. There is hope for all of us. They find a random guy who guts himself, and then we get this. He committed suicide. But before he slit his throat, he yelled something, something like, stay away, don't open the door, stay away. Yeah, we literally get a shitty fake flashback to something we literally just saw a few seconds ago. This has to be a joke. I mean, I know the editor on this film is a joke, but that has to be a joke. John Carpenter did say that he wanted Ghost of Mars to be more comedic than it actually ended up being, so hopefully that was just one of the jokes. But even then, I think that's giving it too much credit. Drop the fucking fuck, cut this dyke bitch head off! Ice Cube says his first line 28 minutes into the film, and they tried to make it literally as ghetto as possible. What do you want, Williams? I want to get the fuck out of here. Yeah, me too. Ballard offers to trade herself as a hostage. This should be a noble move, but it doesn't feel like anything. The film itself is already bereft of like any feeling whatsoever, but unfortunately Natasha Henstridge isn't all that much better. That being said, she is a trooper. She took on her role in this film after doing two films back to back and filling in for Courtney Love at the last minute after her then boyfriend's ex-wife ran over her foot. Natasha Henstridge got so exhausted from the physically demanding nature of this film that she actually fell ill. So obviously the conditions weren't necessarily ideal. That probably explains the lack of charisma in her. And Williams very willingly lowers his knife, which causes her to disarm him. <laughs> First, he fell to the ground, then in the next shot, he was up and punching again. Thanks, Paulie C. Also, why did the other police just stand there and literally watch him assault her? After waking up, she squeezes her nostrils. I know that that's meant to stop the bleeding, but that's gonna hurt like shit if you just got punched in the face. 
Where's Williams? He took off out the airlock. You guys are the worst fucking police officers. You let a criminal get away after you let him assault a police officer. All right, you two take the back door. Raising. Some of the possessed locals start attacking, leading to our first action scene, 31 minutes into the film. Natasha Hemsford shows us that she's not actually that bad as an action hero. Her charisma is a bit lacking, but she's pretty convincing at kicking ass. How the hell that happened? They handcuff him over a series of fades, no less. What exactly happened at K305? Oh no, don't ask him to recall things. We get another flashback, but with a different transition. Williams enters a room, sees something that has gone wrong, and grabs the money. He was just lying there, so you took it. You would have done the same thing. I'm a cop. Yeah, they don't take money. They just take the lives of African Americans. Black Lives Matter. It's a thin line between a cop and a crook these days. That is a cold hard fact, but uh, in the context of being on Mars, I really don't know. I don't think you did it, but that's not my call. So let's not make this any more complicated than it has to be. Yeah, it's gonna be real complicated. You can believe that shit. What it is, soul brother. Jericho spots one of the local nutcases running off with someone's severed head to add to her collection of pikes. It turns out to belong to Pam Greer. Pam Greer is probably the most famous African-American female action star in film history. This movie didn't even give her one action scene. They literally just gave her a bunch of stilted dialogue and killed her off a third of the way into the film. This is not making me happy. Right. He finds a tribe of villains who all resemble the rhythmic criminals from Cobra, but if they were dressed like Guar. And honestly, that design is pretty badass. It's just a shame this entire scene has so many more of those damn fates. Ballard goes to interrogate Bush. Start at the beginning! Please don't! I just cannot handle another flashback. Well, whatever used to live here, we woke it up. It turns out that some malevolent forces possess the locals, and after Ballard kills one of them in what is possibly the most monotonous gunshot execution I've ever seen, it goes to possess another person. Seriously, react less. Who are these guys? I found them hiding up in the mine shed. Oh no, not again. What are they all sparked up about? Used to be miners. Then everybody in this place lost their mind. Oh no, not again. He's up, man. That's it? No flashback this time? Oh, thank God. We were up on the rim when they called the work stoppage. Oh, I spoke too soon. Look at that. They're knocking off early for the night. What the hell is that? You know what it is, bitch. This flashback depicts the members of a mining community all being overwhelmed by a poor CGI fog, one which is actually less convincing than the one we saw in John Carpenter's 1980 film, The Fog, which came out 21 years prior. Here till the storm was over. Later I went out to take a look around. Why did you even bother cutting back? Ugh, God, all the fucking fades and flashbacks, they're just, they're, they're zapping all my energy. It turns out this mystical fog changed the locals into the cast of a Marilyn Manson music video and drove them to start killing each other. The guys telling the story pull their guns on the cops and go to free Williams, but Ballard locks them up, and an alliance is negotiated. Ghost of Mars shows a future in which it is possible to unite a mostly white police force with people of color, who they are typically known for abusing and killing. All we need to do is find a common enemy for everyone to team up against. I want to say transphobes, can we unite police officers and people of color against people who hate the trans community? And I'll cut your fucking titties off. Who's in charge here? You better let go of my Who is in charge here? You! Yeah, Ballard is badass when she wants to be. When did this start? It started a few minutes ago. Please don't take us there! So Ghost of Mars sets us up for a battle between a group of one-dimensional people we don't give a fuck about and a way more interesting group of sadistic mutants. And there is not even a lick of tension. Any questions? Yeah, it was lunch! <laughs> The characters march outside and come under attack, and Paulie thinks that by adding slow motion it will make things intense. He's wrong. You got any fresh ideas? Yeah, what we should have done in the first place. Come on, you mindless motherfuckers! 54 minutes in, we finally get a second action scene, and it's 90% just shots of the actors firing their weapons, but very few shots that actually show anyone getting hit by the bullets. The only bright spots come from Ice Cube being straight up gangster and Jason Statham showing off some of the kick-ass skills that made him one of Hollywood's biggest action stars today. A lot of clips in this scene use slow motion, but none of them actually use it well. In fact, they actually make things less intense because they just drag everything out. Though I will say there are some moments that make a decent use of prosthetic effects. They barricade themselves indoors. Where's your brother? He didn't make it. Oh God. Once their hosts die, they just drift along the railroad tracks from town to town, human to human. What a perfect creation. Vengeance on anything or anyone that tries to lay claim to their planet. So the ghosts are meant to be an allegory for Native Americans? Is this film saying that the Native Americans are evil? It was a Section 740, a scientifically significant find. 
Anymore. Butch reveals that while working on the mountain, her crew accidentally opened up a secret tunnel and unleashed the fog on everyone. You okay? Yes. Why did you start fading mid-sentence? Like, do you want your actors to hate you as much as your audience? Jericho leads Ballard to a confined room for the only reason that you'd expect. Rather cozy. Don't you think? I don't believe this. Really? By this point in the film, this is the only thing that you should believe. This is pretty consistent with everything else his character has done. I thought this might be our last chance to, uh, to dance. Yeah. That is a twist I definitely did not see coming, especially since there is no romantic chemistry between Jason Statham and Natasha Henstridge whatsoever. Just what is the moral here? That if you relentlessly pursue a woman, eventually she will finally cave and fuck you if she's facing imminent death? Like, what kind of message do you want to pass on to your audience with that? But they don't even get that far. They have Ballard finally give in to the idea of banging Jericho and they're not even going through with it. Even then, this scene just has no reason to be here whatsoever. It could have been a moment where she considered her own mortality and then let herself be vulnerable around someone else for a second, but it started as a sex scene and then just quit a few seconds in. Ballard gets possessed, so they dump her outside and drug her to flush out the ghost. She begins having visions of poor CGI lizard creatures who I'm guessing were the natives of this land. According to Wikipedia, this scene is meant to convey to audiences that the ghost of the Martians were actually trying to fight off the human force because they thought that they were protecting the Martians and weren't aware that their people had actually died off long ago. Did you get that from this scene? I definitely didn't. I know I'm only showing you a clip, but like, is that, is that, is that the message you're getting? Ballard eventually wakes up and then gets into another fight. And with this scene focusing solely on Natasha Hensridge, you get a chance to see just how much ass she really can kick. Her fighting skills in this film will actually surprise you. She's good. After emerging victorious, she jumps the fence. Let me in! Let me in! Let me in! After everyone regroups, the villains breach the door. Ballard opens fire while Williams tosses a bunch of bombs at them, which mostly causes a series of explosions that make them fly awkwardly into the walls. The leader drops into the roof, so they bomb him too. But he can't even burn without Paulie C ruining this shot too. There's even this one shot here with a bunch of people fighting in very unspecific locations, and I'm not sure who I'm actually meant to be watching. Eventually they push outside where the train has arrived. They drive through the crowd as everything inexplicably explodes all over the place, eventually making it to the train. Why did anyone give this guy a chance at editing this film? He is genuinely just fucking awful. We've gotta go back. What the fuck is that supposed to mean? We've got a chance to stop this thing before it goes any further. How? It's not their planet anymore. Uh, is this film supportive of native genocide? Am I watching white capitalist propaganda here? The idea was they provide cover and distract the Martians as we set the charges in the plant. Then they'd swing back, pick us up, and we'd all get as far away from Shining Canyon as we could before the place blew. Like I said, it was a simple plan. You keep using the word simple. I don't think you actually know what it means. The only problem was it didn't work the way it was supposed to. The train starts moving and the action kicks off again, but it's full of slow motion. You know, to ensure that it has literally no chance of being intense at all. Amid it all, they actually capture and kill Jericho. So there's something innovative about the film. It's one of the few movies where Jason Statham actually dies. Damn, I don't like that. I mean, I don't blame the film for doing it, but I don't like seeing Jason Statham get killed. We've gotta get out of here fast. I don't think they plan on going in any other direction than out of here. The Martians climb atop the train. Stay here and keep it full throttle. What are you gonna do? Oh, what do you think? What's the one thing he's been doing the entire film? Exactly. Williams adventures out into the obvious green screen and starts dropping some explosive loads. Ballard gets into some close combat with the Martians again and once again reminds us that she really does kick ass. I have to say, Natasha Henstridge's fight skills are one of the few continuously objective good things about Ghost of Mars. Ice Cube gets his own fight scene too and honestly he's pretty fun to watch as well. Oh my god, someone just needs to sample those 10 seconds right there. That is a meme in itself. Ballard wins her fight and goes to turn off the soundtrack. The music in Ghost of Mars is actually pretty decent. It's a solid mix between John Carpenter and early 2000s heavy metal. The explosion goes off, unconvincingly, in two entirely different shots, I might add. What the hell are you doing? Oh, this is where I get off. If we didn't know you were on a moving train right now, that line could have seemed very rapey. I can't let you walk. What you gonna do? Fucking shoot me. <sighs> well, 
More American cops need to watch Ghosts of Mars. And Australian cops for that matter. I think we could all learn a lesson or two from this movie. Look, there's nowhere to run. Anywhere's better than hell. Yeah, that's about how I was feeling. Ballard wraps up her speech to the judge, then wakes up to an alarm, allowing audiences to get a few seconds of Natasha Hedridge in her underwear. Now, given that she got sexualized so heavily with species, it's a really nice chance to see her portrayed as such a badass character in Ghost of Mars. But I can't deny that those few seconds did get me excited as a teenager. Come on. Tide is up. Time to stay alive. If you ever want to come to the other side, you'd make a hell of a crook. You'd make a hell of a cop. Wait, was I watching a buddy cop film this entire time? Is that what the dynamic between these characters was? Let's just kick some ass. It's what we do best. It really isn't. If it was, then you probably would have stopped the ghost like you originally planned when you blew up the fucking power plant. No, they came back because that's not what you do best. Our heroes march towards a fight, which of course we don't even get to see. Instead, we get credits. Is Ghost of Mars a good film? No way. Ghost of Mars is a mess, but it is a spectacular mess. According to John Carpenter, the number one thing that most audiences didn't actually understand when they saw this movie was that it was meant to be made in a style that was over the top and as tongue in cheek as possible. And a lot of audiences actually got pissed off when it turned out to be more campy than they were hoping for. But to be fair, the film's title is literally Ghost of Mars. I feel like that kind of says everything that you should need to know about the movie. Although, if his intention was to make a serious film, I feel like this really got lost on the actors and the editors because they didn't seem to understand that. I'm not particularly bothered by the lazy dialogue or one dimensional performances, but the actors take a very pretentiously dramatic angle to the material, which lacks any comedic timing. Jason Statham and Ice Cube have their natural charms to them, which does make them a little funnier, but not enough to go for what Carpenter was wanting. The decision to swap the roles of Ice Cube and Jason Statham was actually a really bad idea. Statham is way more badass. He should be the character named Desolation Williams. He should be the mythological action hero of the film. He could play either role in the film very well, and he did play Jericho pretty well. But honestly, Ice Cube would have been way more suited to play Jericho, because that way he'd be playing the comedic relief action badass instead of the central action badass. John Carpenter wanted his film to be a silly action movie that was not a full-fledged comedy, along the lines of Commando, Predator, or Rambo First Blood Part 2. And I appreciate what he was going for, but I don't think he hit the mark. He previously tried to do a similar thing with Escape from LA, and he did it better, but even that film didn't get its tone right. I will say, I occasionally chuckled at some of the lines of dialogue in Ghost of Mars because they were pretty ridiculous, as was the line delivery from the actors behind them, but this film still felt too serious. Above all else though, I was just consistently very distracted by how bad the editing in this film was. Seriously. Um, there's not much I can say about the editing which I haven't already said, I'll just say that uh, this, Inchon, and Taken 2 are probably the three worst edited films I've ever seen in my life. It makes me sincerely happy to know that Paulie C no longer has a career as an editor of feature length movies. When I'm analysing certain films, I like to go through the entire plot and point out where exactly they've plagiarised other movies. With Ghosts of Mars, I want to go through this and point out where it's actually copied from previous films by John Carpenter. For one thing, Ghosts of Mars originated as a second sequel to Escape from New York. Snake Plissken was then changed to Desolation Williams. The premise is police officers and prisoners teaming up against a bigger enemy, just like in Assault on Precinct 13. That movie was made in 1976, and this one is set in 2176, so that much is obvious. The enemy in the film starts as a fog, like in The Fog. It possesses people as a malevolent force that passes between them, before trying to converge on people trapped in a building, like in The Prince of Darkness. It turns the mining village into a village of the damned. The entire planet gets turned into an apocalyptic ground of violent mutants, like in The Mouth of Madness. And the entire film is edited with the terrible use of crossfades that originated from vampires, while the intended tone of the film was John Carpenter trying to recapture the style of Big Trouble in Little China. There's also some references to The Thing, but that's more of a stretch. John Carpenter did try something new with this film and gave it a cool setting, but unfortunately when it came to the story, he backpedaled way too much. Still, I appreciate his directorial work on the film. He wanted his movie to be a fun, ridiculous adventure, and even though he didn't exactly get it right with the tone being off and the editing completely butchering nearly any credibility for the film, there is still some fun to be had in the cheesiness and sheer ridiculousness of the messy final product. But the script really does have a lot of fundamental problems. Since this originally started as a Snake Plissken film, there should be some degree of characterization, particularly on someone named Desolation Williams. In this book, John Carpenter actually says that Napoleon Wilson from Assault on Precinct 13 and Desolation Williams from Ghost of Mars are meant to be fundamentally the exact same character. If that's the case, then why doesn't Desolation have more mysticism? Why aren't we curious about him a bit more? He just seems so blank. We should have an understanding of why he's earned a name like Desolation, but we get nothing, just the image of Ice Cube running around throwing bombs at people. Sure, there's some fun to be had with it, but it's not solid writing. And why would you give a character like this so little screen time? They gave him the name Desolation and then intentionally removed Jason Statham from the role so that they could put Ice Cube in, then made Ice Cube's role in the film actually smaller and made Jericho Butler a bigger character. Just... What the hell were they trying to do? 
Nobody really gets any good characterization though, especially Melanie Ballard who was a flat and boring protagonist which is reflected by Natasha Hemstridge's lack of charisma. Although I will say she has some decent moments during the more restrained scenes and she definitely proves herself as a solid action hero, something I would like to see more women playing in Hollywood movies. With the story, it falls flat. I love the concept behind the film, but we do not get enough mythology about the natives or reasons why we should care about the protagonists. So when any of them die, we feel nothing, and when they make a grand sacrifice at the end, still nothing. There's not even that much of an actual plot in the film, so there's every chance that the excess of slow motion and flashbacks will probably simply to extend the film to feature length. With the production values, the results are a bit mixed. I enjoyed the set building and costume design, but the use of miniatures really butchers a lot of believability, and the lackluster CGI destroys the rest. Nonetheless, there's still a lot to enjoy in John Carpenter's Ghost of Mars, because even when he makes a bad film, he makes an entertainingly bad film. One that's so over the top and ridiculous that you can't help but laugh at times. And considering that this film came out the same time as Red Planet and Mission to Mars, and is actually fundamentally more entertaining than both of them, that really says something. And critic Roger Ebert is actually one of the few critics to actually recognize this. He appreciated this movie as a ridiculous over the top guns in space movie. I didn't like this movie as much as he did, but at least the movie managed to find an audience. And to be fair, the soundtrack is pretty awesome. There may be one too many guitar solos being used in the film, but the fact that John Carpenter actually worked alongside guitarists from Anthrax, Guns N' Roses, Buckethead, and Steve Vai himself of all people, that actually goes to show how high a standard he has for music. Ghost of Mars gets 4 Ghetto Birds out of 10. It is not serious or intense enough to be a good horror film, exciting enough to be a good action film, or even funny enough to succeed as a comedy. Above all, it is a crash course on how not to structure or edit a film. But I will say, it has some occasional moments of flair thanks to John Carpenter's eye for imagery, and a sheer level of ridiculousness which occasionally gets hilarious. And that does it for today's episode of Delightful devilish you guys if you have any ideas for movies you want me to discuss on this show please leave them in the comment section below if you want to see more episodes of this show please hit that subscribe button otherwise until next time i've been your host jukebox harry go out and read this book it's a great book and also peace